But if we're talking about an animal that got done dirty, this picture kind of speaks for itself. But if <laughs> Are you seeing this shit? Look, look, look at that. Look at that. What do you think? Yeah, it's not good. You were given all of the positive traits that you could ever imagine. You won the lottery in evolution. You know that, right? <laughs> you know that, right? So stop complaining when you're not exactly getting the same snack as you were getting yesterday. I'm giving you a varied diet. How's it going folks, Jack here with another video and today I'll be checking out some more from Casual Geographics on the animals that got pretty much screwed by evolution. Now evolution is a strange term sometimes to be talking about as I myself had a little conversation with some students that I help with homework and stuff like that, uh, <laughs> explaining some of that through the paperwork. Paperwork, I meant assignment. But like I remember it for myself like when I was back in primary school or even high school to a certain degree like hearing about individuals such as darwin and uh, well noting only certain terms as darwinian evolution as if there were different types of evolution it's like a quaint term that tend to be used in like bad fave arguments sometimes but it is usually followed by stating the one thing that we almost all remember being survival of the fittest now uh, survival of the fittest is not actually always about the fittest Speaking of evolution, I have a little somebody here who decided to join. Hi everyone, I'm Nini. Ain't she cute? Okay, go on. But today, if you open a science paper or a book, for that sake, you will most likely get the more precise definition of it, which is the changes in allele frequencies. Now, what are alleles? I, I really think that you need to decide whether or not you want to sit with me or go play somewhere else. I'm actually trying to explain something here. Okay, well, s s staying you will. So a gene is a stretch of DNA that codes for a specific thing and differences in genes that codes for different versions of that specific things is what we call alleles. Like let's take an example of a population of cats. You'll have a cat like this beautiful creature here with her nice pelt and uh, one that is uh, hairless. So let's now say that in this population of um, a handful of cats, there are three of them that have a gene that actually gives them hair, whereas the other ones in the inverse are hairless. And for the sake of simplicity, we're going to keep them as being haploids, meaning that they can only be the one thing. Is either a hairy cat or a hairless cat. So by doing some sample math, we can divide the allele expressions with the total amount of alleles and we'll get that the hairy ones would be 60%, whereas the hairless ones are going to be 40%, a total, of course, of 100%. And that will be what we call the allele frequency. Then afterward, we have the thing that is called selection pressure, which is basically the do or don'ts to survive. And this can be affected by a plethora amount of things, whether it is living or dead. We are talking about CO2 emission, the environment, predators being present, the amount of food that is reliant on the, the, the survival of the species, uh, the weather, what month it is, is it October already where the sanctity of your home is already being invaded by Mariah Carey and all I've ever wanted for Christmas is you. God damn, it's too early. So these are the things that are going to decide whether or not the cats survive and get to reproduce at all. So fur in a colder climate might be good, but in a warmer one, not so much because somehow the cats can now breathe better if they are hairless and they get to exude a lot of the heat, meaning that they get to survive more. So suddenly over time, as they reproduce over a generation, you get to see that the selection pressure is now different. You have more of the hairless cat being around because the hairless ones had a positive selection pressure. Now that said, the combined alleles are still present, but the expression of them changed over time or across many generations, which is basically our definition of evolution. Now, this is a simplistic way of expressing it, although it might have sounded a little bit more convoluted than what you usually will hear, but it gets even more complicated because we were under the assumption that these were haploids, meaning that they only have one set of genes, which is not exactly the case, right? In reality, we are all diploid. 
as we all get a set of chromosomes for our mom and dad. And unfortunately, she did not get to meet her dad. Hmm. Sorry for you, honey. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that if we were to go back and check out the numbers that we found before, or all depending on whatever result we ended up having in our example, we are most likely still going to see the phenotypes of the species that we were looking at, our cats, the physical traits that they have, but it's not exactly representative of the genotype, meaning the genetic characteristics of them. Now, why am I even pointing any of these? You will see in the thumbnail, for those of you who are a little bit aware of, for example, the hyena that I expressed there, this is a female and I'm not going to talk more about that because he's likely to explain it but this is simply just to express that a lot of weird things tend to happen just like us human beings also does for animals and uh, yeah it gets freaky. But that was to simply give you a quick explanation of what evolution actually is. Now on to the video at hand. Evolution is a name Emily. That's it. That's the whole intro. Don't get me wrong, the concept of evolution is pretty cool. It's the reason giraffes get to flex their high in the entire animal kingdom. But there yeah. are just times where nature and evolution decide to team up and absolutely hug an animal's entire existence. So here are 10 animals that I personally think got done the dirtiest. It's not exactly in order, but obviously some animals are going to get violated more frequently Ooh, than others. And yeah. I say that because if this list were actually in order, the octopus would probably meddle at the oppression of Olympics 4. <laughs> Octopi... Octopuses... Can we also say octopods? Yeah, I think we can say all three. They are like the cacti of the sea. But um, yeah, if I were to be a little bit mean here, they, they are basically the only animal that can actually identify as an incel and be okay with it. Because I would not wish their fate upon anybody. The way that they live, which is also rather short, it's extreme well let me explain octopus are highly intelligent and scientists believe they have the same cognitive ability as a two-year-old human which might not seem impressive but that means octopus are on the same iq level as some dogs they're even and some humans to use tools whether it's using Adults. the tentacles of the venomous man of war as a weapon which they actually do or carrying a coconut around to keep as a travel size panic room <laughs> but being smart is the only thing they have going for them First of all, most octopus come into the world as orphans. The mother octopus will spend months guarding and washing her nursery of up to 50,000 eggs. Since it's too dangerous to leave them alone, since there's no daycare underwater, she often won't eat the entire time. Which means once the clutch of eggs are finally ready to hatch, the mother is shriveling, starving, and ready to become initials on a Twitter bio. Struggle doesn't end there. In fact, that's when it starts. These babies the size of a grain of rice have to figure out life in an ocean full of animals that'll actually try to put an end to it. It's so bad that out of the 50,000 children, if more than two survive to adulthood, it's considered overachieving. That honestly wouldn't be a big deal if nature didn't already nerf them with their lifespan. It's so ridiculously short that a majority of octopus species that live life to the fullest still won't be alive for their first birthday. Be yeah, for what I... For what I learned, like, if an octopus live up to, like, three years, that's, that's, that's an overachievement. It's insane. Like, and also, the thing with the mothers, like, uh, self-deleting themselves, uh, I can't exactly remember if there, if there exists mammals that do that. Like, I know that, obviously, there, there are mammals that eat the young, but where... Actual, the babies actually cannibalize on the parents. I don't know exactly if this is the same concept here with octopods, but yeah, there was a thing, a, a research paper that that came out. It, it was something that I stumbled completely unknowingly about, but that they, they secrete a certain gland in them that drives them insane, and they start acting frantically and even ended up killing themselves. And for the males, well, that, that's why I made the uh, incel comment. Hopefully he gets into it. Being an octopus means you can be born on New Year's, have a midlife crisis by June, only to be a memory by October. Giving an animal high intelligence just to cut its life after one to two years just seems like an intentional dick move. <laughs> and because they have no shell or no armor, they'd honestly be lucky to live that long. Having no real way to defend themselves means a good Ooh. number of them end up a sea lion's chew toy or a dolphin's frisbee. To be fair, octopus do have camouflage. In some cases, highly toxic venom. But for yeah. the most part, they get bodied by most of the ocean. And to add insult to injury, every octopus you see is probably a virgin because once they get laid, they die. You already saw what happens to the mother, but where did daddy at? Once the male octopus mates, he basically just gives up on life. 
The male octopus that's cached in his V-card will swim around catatonically until he either gets torn apart by predators or dies of starvation as his body falls apart due to sickness. Or the female kills him. I like him. it really matters because most female octopus are bigger than the males and sometimes they'll attack and cannibalize him during. But one thing's for sure. Look, it's not just bigger. It's not just bigger. It's significantly bigger. I've seen like scales of giant octopods, females with males that are like extremely small. It's like a 40 to 1 ratio. Mm -mm. No, it's not surprising that they have developed. It's <laughs> okay, I can't believe that I'm getting to talk about this in this way, but that's literally because that was a thing in a previous video with uh, the Okapi and it being the tripod of the mammals. <clears throat> Some octopods have developed <laughs> detachable penises that swim over to the female and delivers all that they need because they don't want to be killed like praying mantises during intercourse. It's genius but it's freaky as hell. If his date doesn't put him out of commission, his post not clarity will. Octopus don't live long, but for the months they're alive, their entire existence is a jihad. Now you know why Squidward <laughs> couldn't give a f if a f paid him. But at least with the octopus, it just seems to be really bad luck. They may be a victim of circumstance, but at least you get the idea that nature didn't go out of its way to screw them. Not like with this bird. Kiwi bird is probably Aww. the best proof that evolution ain't perfect. This tiny bird is actually part of the rat type family. And this cookout includes ostriches, emus, cassowaries, and the rhea. But unlike his big... Oh no! <laughs> That's the worst! Speaking of penises, <laughs> people in the conversation be like, oh, pause, what is going on? Uh, ostriches, because if they were mentioned there, are incredible in this because they are the only avian that don't have cloacas, at least to my, to my knowledge, meaning that they actually have penises. Yeah, it, the more you know. Bigger cousins, this bird that shares its name with a fruit is about 18 inches tall and no more than 7 pounds. It's kind of like having cousins 6, 3, 6, 4, and 6, 6, yet you came out looking like Tory Lanez. Like your family's <laughs> small enough to fit in in an NBA locker room, yet you get it from a chair and stay the same height. But of <laughs> Yeah, when you don't take shots at nature, but nature takes shots at you. Yeah, speaking of Tory Lanez, who shot at Megan Thee Stallion, right? Shot at the horse. <laughs> wow, that was foul. Oh. Of course, nature wasn't done screwing with this bird because like its relatives, they can't fly. Totally flightless. Yeah. And despite being related to ostriches, a Jurassic reject, and a bird that literally won a war against Australia, he kiwi's moves. about as defenseless as the fruit that got named after it. Basically, you're looking at a bird that can't bird. The kiwi is such light work that they can only survive on islands without any mammalian predators because they're really a couple stray cats away from being put in the history books. But... Swiggity swooty though. And somehow, that's not it. Cause nature shrunk everything about this bird. Everything except the eggs they have to push out of the- Oh! That's like an ostrich egg! By comparison folks, ostrich eggs are like 20 times that of a chicken's. They taste very good. But they are 20 times the size of a chick. No way! They have to push that out of... Ow! ...their body. Despite being about 60 times smaller, kiwis have to deal with eggs nearly the same size as an ostrich's. And at 20% of its body weight, that would be like the average woman birthing a 35 pound baby. With the same equipment. It's such a hell to live that the egg actually rearranges the bird's organs and stretches oh. its ribcage. There's too many things wrong with them for me not to think nature had serious beef with this bird. Especially when you realize the kiwi's closest ancestor was the elephant bird, which was about 10 feet, 1,600 pounds. So yeah, they got nerfed bad. At least they didn't get hit as hard as, say, the sloth. For being completely honest here, the sloth has almost nothing going for it. Because they insisted on eating nothing but leaves, their diet makes them one of the slowest animals on the planet. Because they physically can't afford to spend energy they don't have, because going into debt would mean death. It's to the yeah. point where baby sloths have to quite literally hold on for dear life because if it falls to the jungle floor, the mother likely won't waste the energy trying to get it back. And that's because if you're a sloth, leaving this tree is the most dangerous thing you'll ever do. Sloths only poop about once a week and when they do, they'll climb out of the tree and get on the ground to do it. Why they don't just drop a deuce from the trees, I couldn't tell you nobody knows what goes on in their heads. But this <laughs> oh, means no. about half of all sloth deaths involve getting clapped <laughs> on the toilet like Elvis. I was laughing at the image and then he had to pull the Elvis. Oh, this man is a wordsmith. 
Ah, genius. One thing sloths have going for them is that they're so <clears throat> mind-numbingly slow that algae actually grows on them, giving them free camouflage. But there's a catch. There is always a catch. When one of your biggest ops is an eagle with quite literally some of the best eyes in the world, wearing a moss blanket isn't gonna amount to too much. <gasps> And you know Evolution was actively f***ing with them because sloths are actually really good swimmers and can hold their breath for 40 minutes longer than dolphins and seals. But no it means almost nothing when most of the time they go swimming is by accident when they fall out of a tree. And that weak ass doggy paddle might save them from drowning but it won't save them from getting murked by an anaconda or a black caiman. But the really yeah. sad part is, sloths could actually be way better than this. Its close relatives, the armadillo and anteater, are able to put the same claws that it has to good use and anteaters have even been known to swing on jaguars. You have a homicidal vacuum cleaner that has put jaguars and people in coffins. And then you have a moss blanket with a face. And just like the kiwi, the sloth used to be better than this. Megatherium, aka the giant ground sloth, was in the same weight class as elephants and they actually knew how to use those claws. They got nerfed bad. They got really nerfed bad. They were treated to that Windows 8 update. <laughs> they did not need that. So much so that if Ice Age were realistic, Sid would have worn Diego's ass like a fur coat. But its massive size ended up screwing it in the end as they basically got hunted into oblivion by humans. Leaving us now with the virtually defenseless, dead-eyed, slower than molasses algae apartment that we call the Sloth. You know that thing on TV where it's like someone gets a genie that grants wishes but only does so in a way that horribly bends them over in the end and the moral's supposed sure. to be careful what you wish for? That basically sums up this next animal because it looks like it got finessed by a genie in one of the most disrespectful ways possible. This is a fiddler crab. Male fiddlers have one giant brawlic claw whose only purpose is to get a female's attention. Bee crabs choose their mate based on who has the biggest claw and therefore can pass the best genes to her clutch of eggs. Wait, I've seen those before but I was assuming that perhaps the claw was used as a self-defense apparatus but no? Okay, it's simply for aesthetics. So they're like, what? Crustaceans, uh, ostrich crust crustaceans, or just any paradise bird, to be fair. Like, most of them are only there for the aesthetic side. It's not really functional. The problem is, that is literally the only thing this claw is good for. Because that claw is too big to pick up food, the male fiddler crab can only feed himself with that smaller claw. That massive claw is actually a disability that means the males either eat half the food or take twice as long as the females. The only problem with that is that these crabs only eat during low tide and the longer the crab spends eating the more likely they are to end up as someone else's main dish. In the evolutionary arms race for female validation, the male fielder crab is more likely to end up getting eaten by gulls, raccoons, reptiles, and sometimes even bigger crabs. Oh, Since shit. the females enable this by being attracted to the bigger but less functional claws, the fiddler is now trapped in a vicious cycle. It's like... <laughs> I don't know why I my brain consistently just want to make penis jokes today, but yeah, it's like having a too too big of a dick, like it's slowing you down. Sure, you are well endowed, but uh, it is slowing you down. By preferring males with a trait that quite literally gets them put on a shirt, the females indirectly screw the next generation. Gotta be careful what you wish for, especially <laughs> if you're this next animal. Because the peacock has the same problem on steroids. We can all agree that the yep. peacock is the biggest flexor in the animal kingdom, it's and rightfully beautiful. so. And just like with the crab in basically every other aspect of life, bigger is most certainly better. The more colorful and eye-catching, the better the peacock's chances at bagging a pea head. I mean, it is a flamboyant bird. And it is actually something that I, as a kid, thought was like as a, a defense mechanism, like to confuse its uh, assailants, that yeah, the multiple eyes maybe would have warded them away. But not really, it's just for the female. They'll even shimmy their tail feathers in a way that hypnotizes any female watching. But like I said, never make a deal with a genie. Because the good news is a peacock showing off will always be the center of attention. Bad news is sometimes that attention comes from a 700 pound assault weapon with stripes. Oof. And because those tail feathers are so heavy, not only can't the uh, peacock can't see behind see. itself, even if it does see death coming, it takes them longer to get off the ground and out of the tiger's reach. Just like with the crab, the peacock's biggest flex is often what gets it buried. In a cruel twist from fate, the peacocks that are safer from tigers are usually the ones that get less attention from females. So by having a preference, the peahens doom their future Oof. children to a fate of ultimately ending up as a tiger's toothpick. The peacock and fiddler both got handed massive L's from nature, but at least you can see the thought process behind it. Having huge claws and fancy feathers attracts females, so technically it does serve a purpose. In comparison, the Luna Moth got shafted for no reason at all. To make a long story short, adult Luna Moths don't have a mouth and therefore can't eat. The only thing keeping them alive is the energy they store as caterpillars, but once that runs out, so does their time. What? Okay, now that sucks. No, no, no. What the hell? 
Luna Moss lived for about a week, just long enough to reproduce and doom their children to the same fate of a non-consensual hunger strike. If you ask Google why the Luna Moth doesn't have a mouth, it'll tell you because its only purpose is to mate. Which is really nature not giving a fraction of a fuck about them. Yeah, that's cruel. Quite <laughs> some alpha male in some podcast being tired or at least being called out on them using uh, lions and tigers or whatever as the benchmark for what uh, animals or at least what humans and males especially should be acting like you should be like the tiger you should be like the lion but the lioness is the one that hunts uh, no you should be like the tiger instead well some of the cats actually do like to please their mates and actually find intercourse enjoyable and also they have rampant homosexuality uh, uh, fuck pleasure you should be like the ludomorph <laughs> you should mate and die <laughs> jesus christ Oh man, what a- that sucks. What a life to have. Question is, what could possibly be crueler? Well, if you know what this is, you probably have the answer. This is a Tick. sea louse. It's a member of the Caligidae family oh. of copepods, which is basically just a bunch of small crustaceans. Didn't and you know. probably noticed that for the peacocks and the crabs, it was the guys getting the worst of it. Apparently, nature believes in a weird form of equality because right now it's up for the girls. The uh -oh. horror show starts when a male sea louse kidnaps a much smaller female and then forcibly drags her into what I can only describe as a crustacean sex dungeon. Wow! Where he can have up to 20 other victims also trapped. It's at this moment where this movie loses its rating because the male will forcibly impregnate every last female in his burrow and this often involves penetrating her abdomen. But don't worry, it gets worse. As How? her brood of children that she never asked for begin to grow, they decide to start eating their way out. So, uh, my cat left my laps as I started screaming a bit. You okay? Okay, she good. <laughs> what did the actual hell? Eventually, the mother's body splits open as her nursery of psychopaths rush out of her now mutilated husk of a corpse. This might be one of the only times where the babies abort the mother. She doesn't even really get to give birth, her children just bring her death. You might be wondering why evolution would even give this nonsense the green light. Well, the newborn sea louse are entering an ocean full of danger and having a full meal before they make it out on their own apparently increases their chance of survival. And by cannibalizing their own mother, it's basically a home-cooked meal. Somehow, this isn't even the worst birth on this list. That title belongs to the hyena because straight up death is actually better than what they go through. Here we go. Here we go. One of the most brutal birth ever conceived on earth. Ouch. Okay, th this, the previous one might take the cake, but goddamn, this one is also nasty. Female hyenas evolved a pseudo penis that's so similar to the real thing, it's actually difficult to tell males and females apart. This is actually a female. The only yep. problem is, it's not the just for show, they actually have to give birth to that thing. And yes, it's every bit as painful as you think. And just to somehow make it even worse relative to the mother's size, hyenas have to give birth to the largest cubs of any carnivore, and they have to do it through a penis. A good amount of first-time mothers don't even survive this because the process involves rupturing and splitting open the pseudo to make it easier for the cub. But the oh. cubs don't get it easy either. About 60% of hyena cubs will suffocate on the way out and become past tense before technically even joining the present. And you would think because this directly affects the mother and the cub that evolution would have patched this. But apparently nature and Lion King have something in common when it comes to doing hyenas dirty. But if we're talking about an animal that got done dirty, this picture kind of speaks for itself. Are you seeing this shit? Look, look, look at that. Look at that. What do you think? Yeah, it's not good. You were given all of the positive traits that you could ever imagine. You developed a pair that makes you like on the same footing as a baby. You won the lottery in evolution. You know that, right? <laughs> you know that, right? So stop complaining when you're not exactly getting the same snack as you were getting yesterday. I'm giving you a varied diet. In fact, this is probably going to be the thumbnail because this is nature at its grimiest. A lot of y'all probably knew this animal is coming just from reading the title, but for those of you that didn't, that was the skull of the Babarusa. It's a wild pig found in Indonesian islands like Sulawesi. If you already yeah. knew that, it's probably because of those teeth. Those tusks penetrate out of its snout only to do a complete 180 and head right back towards its face. Ugh. The male Babarusa can't wear down this hellish overbite or he doesn't lose them in a fight, then the teeth will end up growing right back into his head, penetrating the skull and ultimately piercing the brain. But the worst part of it all is that by the time it gets clapped by its own dental plan, the Babarusa's probably already had children and therefore pass on its bullshit to its kids. 
It's a lot like Parkinson's. Okay, hear me out. The problem with Parkinson's uh, is that it usually develops late in life, usually around the age of 60. And patients can have it for years without being diagnosed. So by the time they do find out, it's possible they could have already had kids and grandkids that they could have passed it off to. See the problem, right? The only good thing is that it's somewhat rare for a child to inherit Parkinson's from their parents. The Barbarossa? Not so lucky. And as long as females find big tusks attractive, and as long as the tusks only murk them after they've had babies, this pig is going to be screwed eternally and evolution can't even stop it. But when you talk about being sodomized by the fleshy phallus of nature, you're probably talking about cheetahs. If you watch Tier Zoo, if you're watching what? this, you probably do. You probably heard him say that cheetahs are F-tier garbage that either need to be buffed or just vaulted out of their misery. Cheetahs? Why? Wait, because they have max the stats on um, on speed only. Okay, perhaps they they don't have the best defenses, right? But that's that's like a a thing with certain animal, right? The, the what are the, what's the term for it? Not the alpha predators. What is it called? Like there are specific predators that only know hunting. They know that they are so high on the on the pedal stall that. Th that's the only thing that they they have to consider. Fighting against others? <laughs> What's that about? Because they are so confident in their abilities that it's simply that. They can max the stat that they are born with, the, the genetical advantages. So, yeah. Like, I get it. I get it. I love cheetahs, I really do, but out of every animal on this list, evolution might have bodied the cheetah the hardest, and for one simple reason. Cheetahs are really fast. That is all they have. <laughs> Cheetahs are a textbook example of why you should never dump all your evolution points in one skill, because you'll just get Oof. bent over in every other aspect of life. Because they're built for speed and absolutely nothing else, cheetahs often get bullied by other predators, especially lions and hyenas. And because cheetahs have to expend so much energy just to make a kill, it forces them to rest right after, which makes it really easy for other animals to just step in and run their pockets. But for real, if you're a cat and a bird that literally only eats the dead is able to run you off, you got a lot of problems. Worst part is, cheetahs could easily avoid all of this. Lepers are also lightweight solitary hunters that occasionally get their food stolen, but they're able to carry their kills up in trees where they can't get harassed by scavengers. Or muscle mass. But in the evolutionary race for speed, cheetahs evolved non-retractable claws to use as cleats to keep traction while running. Which is why cheetahs can't climb trees, so they gotta get violated on the ground. Cheetahs are <laughs> such pushovers that one hyena can successfully rob several cheetahs right in their face and then dare them to do something about it. Cheetahs compromised everything for speed, so now they get to speed run through life. About 70% of cheetah cubs born in the wild will be 6 feet under before their first birthday. Oh, just to add no. on to that, because why the hell not, thanks to genetic bottleneck, a majority of the cheetah population is highly inbred. What you're looking at is a cat that doesn't really know how to cat. Because instead of roaring like lions, tigers, and leopards, the best this spotted doormat can do is chirp like a bird. Matter of fact, if you YouTube it real quick, you'll find they make every sound that isn't a roar. <laughs> And that's how you know evolution went out of its way to <laughs> them. Cheetahs have been around for about 3 million years and decided they were just gonna I am speed their way through life. <laughs> and because of that, unless it's a 100 meter dash or a bird call contest, this overgrown house cat loses every single time. Obviously there's a lot of good things about the cheetah, but not nearly enough to justify the abuse they go through. Which is probably why a majority of cheetahs in captivity experience severe anxiety so bad that it prevents them from mating and they need an emotional support dog. Which is cute, don't get me wrong, but it's another reason why cheetahs are dangerously close to being Aww. the pandas of cats, and that's not something anyone wants to be. And don't get it twisted, I don't enjoy roasting cheetahs, I actually really love them, but if nature has favorites, this cheetah's mascot isn't one of them. And those are 10 animals that got the middle finger from evolution. I'm not gonna lie to you, this video was low-key a pain to make. So if you like the video and you'd like to support this channel, my Patreon's gonna be in the description, but please, please, don't give money if you can't afford it. Because honestly, I don't need money. I just wanted to cover my crippling Wendy's addiction. Subscribing <laughs> doesn't cost you anything. So, um, think about it. Yeah. Yeah, well, if you retain anything from this video, whether it is from the introduction to the workings of evolution or the fact that evolution is a bitch called Emily. <laughs> remember this one thing. It screws up with things all the time. Or as I remember, Lindsay Nicole, who was featured in the uh, Sea Animals videos not too long ago, uh, said, Welcome to science, bitch. <laughs> but as always, guys, thank you so much for checking out this video. Please do go and subscribe to Casual Geographics if you aren't already. And of course, if you like this one, don't forget to give it a like and subscribe if you'd like to see some more. And I wish you all to have a wonderful day. See you guys in the next one. Bye.